Welcome to the Connor Churland podcast, where I, Connor Churland, meet up with a musician, hear about what makes them tick, what kind of life experiences they're bringing into their music, that kind of a thing. On today's episode, we have Esther Rose, and we talk about things like getting enough sleep while you're on tour, the possibility of a train tour, and some of the logistics that might go into that, as well as a new book, which I have been really into ever since our conversation. Uh, I mean, it's new for me, not new for everybody else. The book is called The Body Keeps the Score, a book about trauma and how it's stored in the body. Super interesting. I'm like halfway through. And I already am recommending it to like a bunch of people. So I have her to thank for me reading that book. So please enjoy this conversation and the song in the middle. Enjoy. Thanks again for making the time. One of the things I found initially so endearing about your habits as you tour is you have the same table with the same items on it that you write on every day is this oh no that's just my songwriting that's just no when i tour i just tour like a normal okay musician. you don't you don't bring a table. i don't bring a table no okay <laughs> i was like man that is so <laughs> dedicated yeah that's don't believe don't believe you know the table stories they're out there yeah 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 <laughs> In the, I think it might have been like an Instagram post that, that you had put out, but you said there was like the same items on the table being like antique glass or something like that. Oh, you know what? I was just talking about um, like moving from house to house. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So yeah, just like having a really simple writing table that doesn't have a lot of technology on it is really useful, I feel like, for my concentration powers to not have a ton of distractions. Totally. When you're on the road, do you have that same ability? Because there's, like, people around and plenty to of write. Yeah. You know how it goes. I feel like you kind of have to, like, grab 15 minutes alone in the hotel room after two weeks. Like, there's not a lot of time to write. That's why... Voice memos are so great. If you have an if I have an idea, I'll just sing it into my phone and usually get back to it. But I think it's it's much easier to write once I'm off the road. I don't I don't usually write too too much when I'm touring. Do you? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I I feel for some reason always embarrassed while writing. It's a because it's so vulnerable, and I'm often testing out phrases that I don't necessarily mean. Mm-hmm. So I don't feel comfortable saying them in front of anyone who's a non-songwriter, unless mm-hmm. we're like, unless I'm like co-writing a song, because then we're both doing something silly. But mm-hmm. otherwise, yeah, I can't do like voice memos in public. I have to like sneakily mm-hmm. go into a bathroom and like quickly say it into my phone mm-hmm. or something. Well, you see people like when you're on tour, like your tour mates furtively in the corner, like strumming something, like they got to get it out. Mm-hmm. So. It's pretty beautiful. I definitely welcome that vulnerability in my friendships. Yeah. Do you often get the chance to co-write with people? I have never co-written a song. That's a cool, fun fact. Why do you think that is? Well, no one's asked me. And Really? Yeah. I think it's just sort of... Wait, where do you live, Connor? I live in Santa Barbara. Are you in New Mexico? I am. But... In New Orleans, I feel like co-writing is, like, not as popular or something. Okay. I don't know. I guess my friends and I will share voice memos and, and demos, and, like, I'll definitely ask, like, my best friends, like, is this line weird? And they'll just be like, no, no, it's, you know, I don't know. Like, I, yeah, I think we just, we just kind of knock it out. But I'm interested in it, for sure. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, I as- I assumed that you had and that you would be really good at it. I don't know why I would have assumed that, but um, yeah, I totally did. How is it? How has it been living in Taos? Mm-hmm. Is that how you say it? Mm-hmm. Um, how how long have you been out there, and what's the what's that move been like? I've only been out here for a few months, um, but it's a place that I've loved to visit. It's really beautiful, and mostly just like getting to be in very desolate, quiet, natural environments. It's been cold, which has been nice. Cool. Um, dry. 
Yeah, it's super gorgeous out here. It's really pretty. Cool. Yeah. Seems like a very big change of pace from tour life. Yeah, but I guess that's kind of why I moved out here because I haven't been. We haven't been touring for a year or more. So it just seemed like, yeah, I'll go live in a tiny town and work at a coffee shop. That sounds fun. Cool. Yeah. I have a friend from Santa Barbara who did the exact same thing and moved there like a couple months ago. To so, Taos? Yeah. And, oh, uh, cool. Yeah, so I was surprised. I read that you were interested in planning a, a train tour <laughs> in order to reverse uh, or to get rid of some of your environmental impact. Can you tell me a little bit mm. more about what what started spurring your thoughts toward your environmental impact? Mm. Well, you know how, for example, how many plastic water bottles the band will even go through just in one night of performance? Sure. It feels like a lot. How many do you guys go through? Well, just like think about, I'm just like picture a band playing yeah. a show yeah. and all the plastic. So I feel like as like, principle just like more like when I come back to touring I want to I already started like you know you have like your cup and you always have your cup like yeah. just try to use your one cup for everything so just like kind of more paying attention to touring less but stronger and more smart instead mm-hmm. of just like always hitting the road and always going for every gig just like being aware and being slow and being careful and being thoughtful logistically regarding the train tour idea i'm so interested in it (laughs) the i mean the west coast has a really good train that like Mm -hmm. you can ride the train pretty far uh but lugging gear and that kind of a thing plus probably your merch plus like additional teammates what also i only know of one train i guess (laughs) so like what yeah like logistically what are what are some of the things you would have to work out in order to 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 figure that out um well i'm looking at working with a booking agent too cool to figure that stuff out yeah yeah i could see it happening more in europe where trains are a thing and they land in all the downtowns and that makes a lot more sense yeah doesn't it it's yeah. kind of trains and like passenger trains are we don't really think of that as much in this country but they're out there yeah it's funny that we I only know of like one, but that's because like I'm not from a place like New York that has like an actual train system. Mm-hmm. While COVID has kind of shut everything down, and you've had a ton of space to like think and ponder things, have you had any other interesting epiphanies that uh, have have shaped how you want to do your business moving forward? Totally. Okay, this one is a big breakthrough. Cool. Give it to me. I, I realized that um, my guitar strap is also my yoga strap. Is also your yoga strap? Mm-hmm. That's amazing. So you just tie it around your mat? Um, you know, like a yoga strap, like for stretching? Oh. Yeah. Okay. But, okay. but a yoga strap is not a guitar strap, right? Yeah. So that's my big breakthrough. I'm hoping that somebody will help me develop this idea. But can't you just picture like all the guitar players like flexing out in the green room, their guitar straps? I wish more people spent time stretching in <laughs> a green room. That would be that'd be a great vibe. Yeah, we need to. <laughs> Especially when people are out on tours for that much. Also, like working out and stre- like working out should be fine. Like like you should it's be not seeing, though. Yeah, you should be seeing people <laughs> doing like sit ups and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> in green rooms that'd be that'd be very thoughtful now that's an podcasts. actual like that's a real business idea of like mini gyms just buying total gyms for green rooms for people to get their sweat on before they get onto mm. the actual stage that was one thing i changed with the last year of touring is i always got a hotel with a gym before i would just be like looking for the right budget price range versus yeah. whatever but i was like just get a if there's a treadmill a treadmill you'll walk on it or whatever yeah, it's super important. That's awesome. Price-wise, was that significantly different compared to like just picking budget options? Well, I get kind of splurgy with the hotel rooms. Nice. I mean, I don't know what your budget is, but I just like three stars or above. Like, 
Yeah. 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 Because then you're paying for peace of mind. Well, I love sleeping. Me too. I'm I'm like an eight hours kind of gal. What about Mm. you? I often go nine, but lately it's been it's been going eight. Nice. It's smart, especially as a singer. Mm. Like your voice needs long, long stretches of rest. Mm. So prioritizing that especially on a tour i mean on a tour you need sleep the most god i love how much you're talking about touring you're like really getting me excited <laughs> <laughs> nobody's been talking about touring you're like what is this train tour and what kind of hotels are you gonna get <laughs> well, <laughs> well i really like practical details and the types of hotels I don't, people don't realize how much your environment affects you as a person um, mm-hmm. like while you're talking about like things like the environment and things like moving to New Mexico and like experiencing the desert and like peace and like that sort of peaceful. And I feel like everybody has had this realization this year of like, if you have a peaceful space to like call a home and like a real space where you like have your own thoughts, you mm-hmm. can do a lot. Like it gives you a lot of fodder. It gives you a lot of, um, ground to stand on. So um, yeah. I feel the same way with sleep and with uh, nice hotels. I also have a wife who uh, doesn't let us like sleep on the floors of places, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. which I also really appreciate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, she raises the bar for y'all. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, you need that. Agree. She's like, I'm giving you a raise, Holiday <laughs> Inn and above. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I still probably won't be using their gyms for a while, but uh, one of the songs I felt really connected with on your album was Songs Remain, um, which I also thought was written, it was was recorded in front of that writing desk, I thought, Mm -hmm. but now Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking that this writing desk is a ghost. No, you got it. (laughs) (laughs) You got it. That is the desk. It's, yeah, we recorded it in my home. It's like the only song on the record that was recorded in my home and not in the Tigerman Den, which is just a event space, which is also very home-like windows and not a classic studio, you know, bomb shelter vibe. But I think that I wonder sometimes about the like solo acoustic songs on my records, if they're just like a little bit easier to get into because they don't have like the whole honky-tonk country sound going for them. Yeah, and... The lonely nature of the subject matter matches really well with the like lonely instrumentation. Mm-hmm. So I I feel like that translates really well, and it's it 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 makes it even more clear. Um, would you be interested at all in playing it? I'd love to. There's also all these men. Uh, they are painting my building right now, and literally like surrounding me like there's just i'm in this window and there's all these men just <laughs> like looking in at me <laughs> it's just so weird <laughs> nice can we see or no uh they can't see you they just see me just watching can you show you. <laughs> can you can you show us what you see here would that be too difficult uh yeah the hold on uh i'm plugged into so many things uh <laughs> let me, let me, never hold mind on. should i play the song for them would that be nice if you just... No, they literally, like, look into my window all the time and give me this stinky eye. <laughs> and I'm like, it's just so weird to get the stinky eye from someone who... You're in my space, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, Maybe not. I'm in my house. If there's a place I'm allowed to be, it's my house. If there's a place you're allowed to be stinky. Um, good, yeah. I'm going to sing while you're doing this. Is that cool? Oh, I'll put, oh, I love it. Okay, never mind. We'll just we'll do that later. Picking up and dropping me off. Tell me, did you ever fix your truck? Lay me down in the afternoon. Go a little crazy when I'm in my mood. You know I love. Okay. 
sounded great thank you inner city lumberjack is a great great phrase that's what those guys on the on your house are no in the song you say inner city lumberjack oh yeah yeah Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) no these guys are just painters Mm. (laughs) i was like almost cut that i'm like gosh but it made me it made me laugh so i kept it you wanted to cut it because you thought it was too silly it's just such a thing, isn't it? I don't know, like, whenever there's a line in a song that's just, like, feels too good, so, or, like, too something, I'm just, like, not too good, but it's, like, it just stands out. You know, how do you, yeah. like, what's your editing like? Like, I'm sh- do you cut a lot of stuff, or do you kind of keep it, or what? Uh, I cut a lot, but also I write a lot of bad songs. So when you write a lot of bad songs, you're just constantly ditching a song and being like, I like this phrase, so I'm just going to keep this phrase in my pocket. Mm -hmm. And um, (laughs) yeah, so I I throw away 80% of what I write. Bad to you. You play them for at least one person, right, to make sure they're not bad? I used to. Mm -hmm. And then I got enough under my belt where I was like, I understand that they these aren't necessarily bad. They're just not good. So they're, they're just not like to your standard of good. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But but there are a lot of songs I haven't played for a soul. Like mm. not maybe even your like, wife. No. Like mm. I I just don't think because sometimes it seems you're the same way of like using writing for self understanding and like as part of the revelation process in your own psyche. Maybe you come in it with a question and not necessarily trying to get an answer, but maybe you have a better sense of the question mm-hmm. by the end. Sure. Well said. Yeah. And at that point, if the if the song isn't like catchy or interesting in your opinion, you're just like, oh, okay, I just, I used it kind of like a journaling exercise. And mm-hmm. now yeah. I understand myself a little bit better. 
I believe in writing bad songs as well. It's so useful yeah. to just like, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like every good song has like one or two bad songs before it to get to it. But then I think of stories like Dolly Parton just wrote, she wrote Jolene and I will always love you on the same day. But she wrote like how many songs to get there? Like I love like the timeline of songs in the, especially like in my voice memos, like to see what and how each one kind of came from each other one. So do you see yourself as kind of like iterating on a song like for a long stretch of time? Like you write it and then you continue to just tweak it until it's... Lately, this last song I wrote took three months or something. Like the longest, but that's also because I was really busy with the album promotional campaign, which is over. We're just hanging out. Congratulations. Yeah, we're just, we're just meeting each other yeah which is nice um yeah but i would like go to it so hungrily going to the song like can't wait to like work on this thing and see what's happening with the song and i ended up doing for me something i've never done before which is like a modulation into a key change into a, and i was like my songs are pretty simple like i i call myself a beginner guitar player sure i'm still just like working around the cowboy chords not doing too much stuff up up, up the fret yet. Yeah. Like, yeah. we'll get there, but just haven't yet. So, right. this new song has been so fun to like let the in, let my interest stay peaked in in the song, and mm. with that sustained focus to really take it someplace totally new. I, yeah. I want to do that now to every song. When you're writing a song for three months, is it like? you have the general melody in line, like you kind of understand where you're going to go and then you're just filling in the pieces. Or is it like I wrote the first verse and have like zero inspiration for the rest of the song. Now I'm just kind of stuck. And you're like, you continue to go back to it and be like, keep checking in to see if it's any clearer. Usually I'll get like a pretty good first draft with some lyrics that I'm really excited about. And then it's just like slowly exploring lines it's hard for me to rethink a melody entirely for a song once it's locked in. That is so hard. One awesome example of a rewrite, I was just reading about Bob Dylan's song, Tonight I'll Be Staying Here With You. Do you know that song? Bob, Bob's like has a birthday coming up, so I'm writing a bit about one of my favorite songs for him. Um, not for him, for like a magazine. He's not going to read it. He probably hates that stuff. He's like, God, the writing about me... I can't do a Bob Dylan voice. He probably reads it religiously. No, I'm sure he doesn't. He's going to love your piece. (laughs) Anyway, I was reading like the first draft of this song. Tonight I'll be staying here with you. And like the lyrics are not as good. The lyrics that stand out so much to me in that song. There's a poor boy on the street. Let him have my seat. Because tonight I'll... That was like, if there's a cowboy in this place, let him da-da-da. And I was like... Oh, he's just like, he's like, just like, you know, filler phrases and then like making them better and better and better. And I love that, like care and that the Mm -hmm. song is kind of always with you. Part of you is just like thinking about a song and open to like an an idea for like a lyric change. I think of it as kind of like a crossword puzzle where there's a certain number of boxes and a clue as to what it relates to and you're just seeing what but instead of letters it's syllables and like being like Mm -hmm. what other syllables can fit into this spot it's a fun game that we play all alone in our rooms (laughs) (laughs) and on walks uh i learned that you yeah you like going on walks with your voice memos yeah for sure or podcasts now that you don't have like the french quarter to walk through with your voice memos do you have a particular route that you're really Digging in New Mexico. Route. Yeah. I love city living for the fact of just like no cars and just like as soon as you're out the door, you're just walking or biking wherever you're going. I barely drove in New Orleans and I love that. I feel like, yeah, having like a little route just outside the door is so important to not, to not jump in the car to go somewhere. For me, mm-hmm. yeah, kind of like takes me out of the moment. Makes me like, I don't know, more in the trance driving around. Does that trance like, when you're driving ever help you write songs or is that mostly just distracting? Like you just zone out? Gosh. Yeah. 
I like to write, like, when I'm starting a long drive, I get really excited in the morning, you know, Mm -hmm. stimulated by, like, new views and, but it's not my most compelling place to write driving. Sure. Yeah. It's also probably the least safe, so (laughs) probably don't. Probably don't. I mean, it's hard not to. It's a place where your mind drifts, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not safe. Yeah. There's a there's a word that you've mentioned in a previous interview. I'm gonna go ahead and not do the pronunciation and just spell it. It's a Portuguese word, S A U D A D E. Can you pronounce that for me? Oh, I looked it up. I think it's saudade or saudade. I can't remember if like the G is a different. Do you want to just just wiki? So I I wrote out the pronunciation but i was like if she knows how to pronounce it then i'm not gonna look like a fool <laughs> but, no. but if you don't also it was saudade saudade how did you learn that word and what is its role in your songwriting one of my favorite things to do is play like dictionary.com pronunciations by the way i love just like clicking like reliquary or like whatever like whatever word like i love hearing words wow. like love language words everything like I just love hearing it so um when I'm not just clicking um word pronunciations I don't know that word I guess it just kind of worked for the piece I was writing about which was for sex and magic one of my songs that mm-hmm. kind of like plays into the kind of this word in Portuguese is said to like not really have a very literal translation it's just like a feeling like a nostalgic remembrance or longing Mm -hmm. that's why music and songwriting is so special because we're all using the same rhymes love love me do you know i love you always be true like yeah yeah whatever we're all using like the same words that we've been using there aren't any new words really Mm -hmm. but what we do with them and how we emote them and the feeling that why is underneath and that can only be described in the melody as like set free so i guess something like that (laughs) you're an excellent essay writer by the way i was really impressed takes me a long time takes me way too long to write those like 800 words i need a month 800 words is a lot that's what they give school kids because people love to torture school kids so (laughs) Um, I don't I don't blame you for taking a month. Um, I haven't written 800 words in like <laughs> a decade, so I uh, I don't envy it. Speaking of your songs and the album, you had a uh, album illustrations little booklet with different pictures by uh, Jackson Tupper. Do you have ooh? Do you have a a favorite one of his illustrations in there? Probably this one is. My Subaru, rest in peace. My Subaru that blew up. This is a it 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 like the engine exploded. I love how he did like the contrast. Yeah, it's so cool. Because at first I thought it was like a I thought it was like a Boba Fett kind of a guy. Yeah, I know it's hard to see. It's it's the headlights of the Subaru. It's so cool. Yeah. Um, and then I also really like this one, which is like the match rose for the song keeps me running. Like matchstick faded rose um yeah yeah. i don't know it's just so special to have to work with a really like great illustrator and just to kind of like think of each song as like its own special icon those are sweet icons for like the the level of simplicity for uh the amount of beauty is pretty impressive well we wanted this record to obviously be like my goth country record so goth it's very country. important. Why yeah. goth? Just like to honor like the mall goth, Midwestern mall goth trapped inside of me that just channel that out a little bit. Cause you know, I'm, I'm like, we're all millennial. I'm a millennial. Bar- I'm just barely a uh, mm-hmm. millennial. Um, and there's just so much else going on influencing me besides c- country. Yeah. So I wanted the art work of the album to really like show that multi-dimensional aspect a mall goth so would that refer to like someone who would attend a spencer's 
store in the mall that that kind of a mall goth or like yeah for sure okay just like like a tilly's no that was like punk right Tilly's. i don't know there's it's okay if it's both i was like pop punk i was just into like rancid and like afi and against me i just loved like angsty pop pop pop. it was like i guess it was like folk punk when i think of against me did you listen to them uh no i was a big i I really enjoyed pop punk. Uh, I was a big like a day to remember fan, um, like Mayday Parade, like Four Year Strong, the the kind of like singing and uh, yelling kind of kind of music um, mm-hmm. about your feelings. This is yeah, um, that was my my kind of favorite. I came uh, across one of your quotes saying that when it comes to your music, you don't want people like this is like a largely like a breakup album but not wanting people to think about your relationship like just wanting them to like have their own association with the songs because obviously like songs aren't like the perfect representation of anything so like why it's like it's not necessarily the best way to learn about something um what do you what do you think is one of your least understood songs and why oh my gosh this is really funny well i thought this was really funny (laughs) And it never crossed my mind. But like, so the very first song on the record, how many times? Mm -hmm. There's this line, dinner and a movie, scrape the bowl. Okay. And and I just like, was thinking like, you're just like watching a movie depressed in your house. And then like, you see your reflection on the laptop and you're like, I'm just like eating ice cream and like being like a bummer or whatever. But somebody was like thought of that as like dinner in a movie scrape the bowl like smoking weed and I was yeah, like, yeah yeah cool scrape the bowl <laughs> that's, not, that's not actually the reference is scraping the bowl is that a phrase is that a that stoner is thing i guess so i mean you gotta scrape it out and put something new in there do you scrape the bowl <laughs> I, like... <laughs> I like it though i was like that's great that's kind of better than like me eating cheerios and watching netflix or something i don't know yeah it's it's not too dissimilar from no it's from not the actual meaning yeah well wonderful i would like to uh move into the unrelated questions portion where i ask the same questions that i ask uh, a lot of other people but because i think they yield very different and interesting results what is the the worst gig you ever did okay wow I think that sometimes like the worst gigs are also like strangely the best mm-hmm. somehow. So there was a gig, there's this like dirty old dive bar called Springwater Supper Club in Nashville. It's like behind the McDonald's. And I think it was like my first time touring through Nashville. And we were just, I was touring like with my ex's band and we were just kind of cold calling clubs to kind of try and play anywhere. And so we went and played, we played at Springwater and didn't know Soul. And I think like two people came to that show. One was like a couple and they were just drunk dancing right up front in a totally empty room. And then the other person was like Buddy Miller who like heard us on the radio and was like, wow, cool. I'm going to go check out this band. Buddy Miller is like, like a, like a totally great, like songwriter, producer guy in Nashville. Like anyway, so I was like. Learned from a very early age, like you never know who's listening. You always got to just have fun no matter what and do mm-hmm. it, do it because you want to do it. Right. Like, is there a particular book that's meant a lot to you in this last year as you've, I mean, everyone is re- reassessing their life and reevaluating. A lot of people have turned to books as a really good resource in the last year. Have you had one that's stood out to you as more meaningful? I'm now like doing my second pass. Of this one. The body, the body keeps the score. score. I have heard good things about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What? Uh, and just enlighten read it. me. Yeah. No, enla- just read it. Zero, it's just one of the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you a thing about this book. It's about understanding trauma and how it's physical. Yeah. And learning how to like basically just rewire your brain rewire a, your, you know like learning how to establish new patterns and thought patterns and that like trauma is like extremely common and it's like not a big 
deal if you have it and like it's just like a tool it's just like a really good tool and then then is there any bad advice that you've received from or what bad advice have you received regarding your music career (laughs) bad advice it's kind of funny someone once really recommended that i like take vocal training and I'm really stubborn and I just want to figure out how to do things on my own. Like with Mm -hmm. guitar, I just wanted to teach myself. I would get a friend to like show me a chord and I'd just go be like, okay, I'm going to go learn it. Like, I got it. Like, let me go in my room. And I'm really glad that I didn't let that person, that one person's opinion just like blow me out of the water and make me want to stop singing. Mm Because it takes a while to find, took me a while to find my voice. And the best thing to do is just sing a bunch and play yeah. shows and like notice what feels good. Mm-hmm. Notice what feels pleasurable. I'm like listening back. Like I always would tape things and listen back to every show just to be like, you're missing, find out how, where I'm missing notes and how to smooth things over. Not that I don't do that now. I'm actually really out of practice. I've just been playing on podcasts, and right. hanging out online. So when you were initially practicing were you playing shows and you just have your voice memo on in the background and then you'd listen to the whole thing over again oh yeah for sure put it in my pocket or put it on the sound guy's desk um wow yeah i feel like if we as musicians like if i can't listen to my own set if i can't listen through like i should not expect anyone else to listen to me i've got to be into it i've got to love it and i've got to be like interacting with it right not just like putting it out there and walking away. It sounds like that would also be helpful for the moments between songs when most people don't realize how quiet a place gets when they like finish a song and then they just kind of like t- retune their guitar and say nothing yeah. and then they move into the next song. And it's like, well, that was a long time that we heard yeah. nothing from you. That was, a, that was a two and a half minute break yeah. where everyone in the band drank their whiskey, mm-hmm. put their cup down. Yeah, but also I got to say, I have been an attendee of some of a show where it was like a big old rock show and sold out and and the band performing still had like that quiet moment of tuning. It was actually thrilling to have like Mm. this loud rocking band and then that quiet where people could like call things out to to the band and like ask questions and interact. Kind of like broke the spell in this really cool way sounds like it would make people save all their comments for that space and then Mm -hmm. all their energy could be shot back in a concentrated fashion versus constantly interrupting like between every song yeah totally which can sometimes happen last uh last question i believe do you have anybody that you see as a role model or mentor or hero whatever word you want to use regarding your musical career slash life like as you think about what kind of life you want to live moving forward totally yeah i'm always searching for role models of people who do it gracefully people who grow with their music grow with their fans i feel like my two role models my mom and my other mom bonnie Raitt is so amazing and i feel like her thing that i love i've read i've read some um, interviews with her and she records with live with her band for like a week to tape And I'm like, okay, she's been doing this since the 70s. So I feel like her methodology is like similar to mine. Like, Mm -hmm. let's just get the band together and record live. Like, it's such a vibe. I love it. She just has this charisma that is just like freaking unstoppable. Really seems like she just loves performing. Also, like she had her breakout album in her 40s after like doing 10 records. I'm probably getting all these numbers wrong, but it's like a loose approximation. Um, Yeah. I know that when it, Luck of the Draw came out, it was like she was a woman like in her 40s singing about like real heart stuff and yeah. didn't really have the support or belief from her record label that it was like, but that was the, that was the album that like broke through and um, I love the album so much. That's amazing. It's, I think it has I Can't Make You Love Me. I don't know if you know those songs. I know I know that song, but I wouldn't know which which album. Right. And then of course, Joni Mitchell is such a role model, ever changing, ever 
alienating, isolating. She's just like managed to be so authentic and such a weirdo. I just want to have a glass of wine and smoke a cigarette with Joni Mitchell. <laughs> yeah, her stories are just so real. They're so real, but they're so like every time I listen, I learn something new from the song. Just like hear something new. They're, they're just loaded. They're totally loaded. Yeah. With so much good stuff. Is there a particular way that you want to get weirder as you grow? I don't know that I want to like get weirder. I just want to feel more comfortable. Like for a lot of the songs that I've written, I would ask the band like, is this too weird? Like, can I do this? Like, mm -hmm. is this, is this acceptable to sing like this? Like mm -hmm. just basic stuff that to me felt like weird or maybe I was being too weird. And so what I'd rather do it's like, and, and the band would always be like, no, like we love it. Do mm. that. Yeah. Go for it. If that feels, you know, they, no one would hinder the weird. So I just want to be more like, I want to be less judgy on myself and have less like thinking maybe something might be weird and just kind of let it out. Yeah. I have a very weird, weird group of friends who have been supportive of me since I was a little kid. And so when we get together, it's kind of ridiculous i i hope that you also get to experience the the joy of being weird yeah again thanks so much for for hopping on the podcast um that's all i had for you so i'll go ahead and clap <laughs>